Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Maybin Khadra. I am business anchor and economic analyst at CNBC Arabia. It's my pleasure and honor to be here with you. Today, we're going to be discussing a very important, not only topic, but also industry, the leisure and hospitality, specifically after what we have seen during COVID and this inflationary environment. What's ahead? What kind of structural shifts have we seen in this industry? To help us go through these questions, questions and more, I would like to welcome our speakers, Mr. Qusay Al-Fakhiri, CEO, Tourism Development Fund, Mr. Sebastian Bazan, CEO, Accor, Mr. Manfredi Du Video, Chairman, Eber Combi and Kent and Silver Sea Cruises, and Mr. Greg O'Hare, Founder and Senior Managing Director, Certain's Management Limited Liability Company, Please join us in this panel. Please all have a seat. And thank you so much for being with us today. So when we talk about leisure and hospitality, of course, this is the most affected and impacted industry in the world during the year of 2020 because of COVID-19. And when I look ahead and I look at the current economic environment, it's pretty much a, a, a terrible eco. I'm sorry? An eco. Ah, you have an echo. Okay. Uh, please, guys, if we can solve this problem with the echo. Anyways, they're going to try to solve that. <clears throat> so going back to our discussion, what we're seeing with the current economic environment is this is highly inflationary. We have high energy costs. We have higher input costs. And eventually, this is going to impact the world economy and different sectors as well. I want to start with you, Mr. Greg. And when you look at the leisure and hospitality sector and industry, to what extent are we seeing structural shifts when it comes to consumer behavior? So since the pandemic, first of all, thank you for having us. Since the pandemic, we've seen a lot of changes in the way people travel. Right now, 70% of people in the world have told us that they will travel no matter what no matter interest rate, no matter currency differentials, no matter inflation, no matter COVID. For instance, in July in the United States, the TSA, which is the people who process the security, reached 114% of 2019 capacity. Last year, Sebastian will probably agree with me, that year over year, 600% more Americans went to Europe than did the year before. So six times as many Europeans went. Um, this, wi this winter, at Christmas, or the, over the holiday season, more Europeans will go to America, despite inflation, despite the lower euro, despite energy costs, uh, than have ever been to, to America before. Uh, TripAdvisor, which sits on clicks um, uh, and, and is a good measure of demand and intent, uh, is at 100% of capacity, so it's the same number of people going online to look at where and when they want to travel. The fastest growing sector now after COVID is experiences. People are choosing what they want to do in order to inform where they want to go. Uh -huh. And finally, what is a big change is uh, EMEA is, shows the highest intent to travel. So Europe, Europe, Middle East, and Africa has the highest intent to travel of anywhere in, in the world. If Wait. I can add something. Yes, please, Mr. We Mr. have an incredible growth in the, uh, and the people that want to go to visit Africa and Egypt especially. Egypt has been amazing. I have to select the people who will take the vacation. Sometimes they call me to say, please, my friend, can you get me in? And the same thing is going to happen in the Middle East and in Saudi Arabia because it's really, from a European point of view, it's the Caribbean of, the, of America. It's good weather, and plus, on top of that, it has amazing destinations. So the growth is amazing. In our sector, which is experiential travel, Abercrombie and Kent, growth 2022 to 2019 is very, very high, 20 30% higher. And in the luxury cruising, also, we're experiencing going back to the old numbers. Great, but I want to ask you, Mr. Manfredi, as well, there was this perception during COVID that it's not safe to go on a cruise. Is it safe right now? Can I go on a cruise and be safe? I go. Is it safe to go on a cruise? Huh? Is it safe to Le go on let cruise? Me, let safe? Me. Cruises? Yes, because during COVID, it well, was, there was this perception. If you think about it, cruising is the only enclosed environment where you know everything which is happening. 
So the crew stays on board. The crew doesn't go back home. So from a health point of view, it's extremely controlled, which is the reason why it pops up. Because if there's a case of something, it's immediately signaled. But also, right. cruising can control it very well. We have procedures now in place which have become very effective. I mean, Saudi Arabia had been operating a cruise uh, during the, in the middle of the pandemic very successfully. It was an accident right. the first day, the cruise was postponed, and from then on, nothing. Okay, great. So we have good news here. Sebastian, what's your thought on that? On cruise line? I know nothing no, about No, on the, the leisure and hospitality <laughs> sector overall and the changing in consumer behavior following COVID. Well, number one, we have a blessed industry. Number two, it's a sizable industry. 10% of all the people working on this planet happen to work for tourism and travel, 10%. It's huge. Number three, it has been proven to be very resilient. I can tell you, through COVID, we went to hell. It's yes. the first time that I guess for me as a CEO, I had to close 5,000 hotels in three days. Wow. In 120 countries. And that was not a good time for anybody, certainly not for me, because that was a conscious decision. And with that decision, I knew I was impacting 300,000 employees. And we, I just want people don't to forget about it. When that decision was made in March of 2020, I knew that half of those people on which I imposed a decision will not have a paycheck on the 7th of April. Because all the Western world, America, have been subsidizing the hotel company to, for them to be able to continue paying employees. Yes. Go to Southeast Asia, go to Sub-Saharan Africa, go to other places in South America. Those subsidies did not exist. <coughs> so I just want to make sure we don't forget about it. And those people have been back because it's a very generous industry. And everybody which I've been hearing for the last two years telling me hospitality will never be back before 2023, 2024, have been dead wrong. Hospitality yes. has been rebounding faster, stronger. Why? It's because everybody on the planet were afraid of dying and they wanted to regain control of their life. They wanted to breathe again. They wanted to enjoy life and to meet people. And they've been traveling not far. Many of them have been traveling less than four hours away from where they live. So okay. resilient, sizable, attractive, very human. Uh, and at the end, I know Saudi Arabia pretty well. And I was at Alula on Friday night for the banyan tree. They still probably hundreds of places, hidden, hidden gem that people never discovered. And I probably believe 90% of the Saudi nationals probably never been to Alula. So that industry will expand. The one thing, and I know we're going to be talking about it, is there is financing, there is brand, there is expertise, there is geography. And there are opportunities. But we, but we need to actually seduce more the young population of to course. come and work for this industry. There's a lot of questions to be answered there. So, Mr. Sebastian, Mr. Kusai was describing the opportunities we have in the sector, the recovery from COVID, and he mentioned as well the spillover effect we had from this industry on the economy, economic activity of many countries, and even on labor sector. In your opinion today, how would you characterize Saudi tourism sector? Thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum. So, let me start with complementing what the gentleman mentioned. Saudi Arabia, so in addition to Sebastian mentioned, it's not only sizable, it's expandable as well. Um, Saudi Arabia has been outperforming domestic tourism by far globally this year. This is just the start. I mean, if you add to that religious tourism, if you add once the GEGA projects and tourism development fund projects, once they are up and running, you can imagine the potential and the unlocking of potential investments in this sector. The fund so far been, I mean, this is our second operational year. We believe what we have done is remarkable. This is proven on the market. We have built a track record. We've been attracting the right developers slash investors globally. Tourism Development Fund today is acting as an ecosystem by its own. 
also, of course, relying on the larger tourism ecosystem and the larger government entities. The fund was established in June 2020 with a bid up capital of $4 billion. Today, thanks to TDF team, to leadership, and to our esteemed board members with the support, and thanks to our, the confidence from global partners and local investors, we have a commitment of almost 7 billion real, that's almost one plus billion dollars with a project size of more than 20 billion reals. This is only on our second operational year. So you can imagine how big is the market is and what's yes. the potential. And I, I see the look of my colleagues here, how they look at this. And we invite every single one to tap into this. The potential is huge. All what we need is to activate, to focus, and we start building for the future. And I think um, this is what we're hearing from the last three days, not only in tourism. This is for the vision and hopefully tourism, and this is on us, we are eager to outperform other sectors as well. So may, may I add something? Yes, please go on, I, I talked yesterday to the Minister of Tourism without knowing. Five years ago, at the time, the plan was established for 2030 by His Royal Highness. I was alerting everybody on, could we please have a plan on training, academy, formation, and ACOR has been in this country for 35 years, and we have almost 20,000 employees already in Saudi, except less than 20% are Saudi national. So I was alerting everybody by saying, please, can we build a common academy? And I was repeating the same sentence yesterday, to which the minister told me, Sebastian, you're late. So I went this morning to the Minister of Tourism's offices and I went to meet 12 people from the International Academy of Tourism. What has been done in this country for the last two years in terms of numbers of university dedicated for tourism, learning French, English, of course, uh, Arabic is part of the culture, it's mind-blowing. 70,000 Saudi, and even in Alula, we have 320 employees, 43% are Saudi national. So, I just want to apologize for what I said yesterday. I was dead wrong. Yes, I'm happy to be late, and I'm going to try that I guess the private sector embark and make it even actually more scalable. But I guess I just want, it's a big bravo because I didn't know, and what I saw this morning, rigorous discipline, vision, ambition, expertise. Well I, done. I, I like this key word, yes, of course. <laughs> the key word here is vision, I think, up to great extent. And Saudi Arabia vision for this sector is to be a great contributor to uh, Saudi economy and of course the collaboration between the private and government sector because we cannot put everything on the government sector and Greg I want to ask you about this to what extent do you feel and do you see the need for more contribution from the private sector when it comes to pushing the vision ahead and and achieving the vision that, that may be the biggest softball question I've ever been handed in my entire life. Um, I, 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 listen, the government is a fantastic organization to work with. Almost every branch we meet is dedicated to spending a lot of capital. However, there are not a hundred million people sitting in their homes today all around the world trying to figure out how to get to Saudi Arabia, right? You're competing with Italy, France, Spain, Germany, um, Greece uh, for that for, for those tourism dollars and so the big shift I've seen with, with with the government and with the private sector first of all there's lots of investment in infrastructure going into the into Saudi Arabia from the private sector today I think the other part of the cooperation has to be attracting people to come to Saudi Arabia so for instance you know um, uh, some of the the Saudis that, that I, I deal with have called me the deputy mayor of Alula. I keep getting asked the same question on these panels about where is the place that nobody knows about, that everybody should go. And we always talk about Alula to, as, as a great example. And it, it still has a long way to go. We're committed to, to deploying capital in Saudi Arabia. Uh, the government has multitude of partnerships to be able to do that with. 
we can attract Americans, Europeans, Asians, Southeast Asians, Australians, Canadians, Latin Americans to Saudi Arabia. You have skiing in the north. You have desert in the south. Oftentimes, my friends that I talk to in Ceuta, it'll be 40 degrees in Paris, and it'll be 22 degrees in Ceuta in, in the summer. I think the big thing is educating the rest of the world what's available here, having capital applied in public-private partnerships, and those seem to be the most successful things that are going on here. To do it by yourself without a Saudi partner, sometimes very difficult. The government's been excellent at identifying Saudi partners for us, at trying to find Saudi partners for us, at showing us how to work um, with Saudi partners. I just want to add one thing to what Sebastian said. We have been so impressed by the quality of the local executives and the local management, not just the workers, uh, Sebastian, but the local management here, that in every meeting I go to, and QSAC can attest to this, um, I talk about how to identify talented local managers that can come and work for our companies. So I think they've been really helpful in making it easy to invest here. We're looking for more and more projects. We, they have a multitude of things to do, and we think we can really pivot a lot of people to be able to come here. If I may add two things. Please, Manfred. I mean, what Greg said is exactly true. I mean, there are so many destinations that offer themselves. Why choose Saudi Arabia? But it also depends very much where, you're, where the source is. For Europeans, Saudi Arabia is a natural destination because it's only five hours, five hours and a half by plane, one hour or two hours time zone. So you can go in a place which offers unique things, weather, history, culture, natural beauties, variety of natural beauties, at a very short distance. Of, uh, and so. It's really something which is a great opportunity, I think. So Europe is a natural basin to start. And also Europeans are very much acquainted of in relationships between the Middle East and uh, European countries. We've always had a lot of training activities, the French, the Italians, the English. We've always been uh, training a lot. I came to Saudi Arabia in the 70s. So I've been coming here now, it's what, 50 years. So it's, it, for me, it's natural to come here. It's of a, course. It's a train. That's uh, the first thing. And the second thing I, I want to say about uh, the talent is that there is an, a unique skill of the, uh, the, of the people I've been interacting with is to create bonding and uh, to show passion. So everybody I meet in the senior positions in Saudi Arabia are really passionate about what they're doing and they tend to bond with the people they're going to interact with. So with all of you that I've met since now, what is it, three years I've been coming, almost three times a year, it's a natural relationship that comes and you become friends and when you see each other, it's really an emotional uh, getting together. And the passion that each one of you shows, I don't see normally in places where it's just a job. Right. It's really being, you feel that you're part of this great vision of 2030, accomplishing it and bringing your country to where it wants to go for the next level. So uh, there are two words that keep coming up through our discussion. One of them is talent. The second one is educating the world and letting the world know what's in Saudi Arabia and why more people should come here and visit here and enjoy whether the weather or the landscape or other things. But I want to stop at the thing of talent. We always talk about attracting investments attracting funds, attracting FDIs to a certain sector. Today, we're moving away from only attracting funds to attracting talent, attracting know-how. How can be this, how this can be done, please? It's, it's, it's difficult and it's easy at the same time. It depends which population you're targeting. Our core, I told you, is 300,000 people and we lose 10% a year normal, they go someplace else. So that means I have to rehire 30,000 people every year. But we open one new hotel every day on the planet, 365 hotels, which means I need to hire 50,000 people to just run the new hotel. Total, 80,000. Two-thirds of the 80,000 people we hire are people who never had any education, never had any prior job. 
between 17 and 25 years old, local community, give them a chance in life. There's nothing better than hospitality when you can teach probably 50 different skills. You can be receptionist, you can be look after the luggage, you can learn to be an electrician, you can be a runner, you can be a maitre d', you can be a cook, you can be a commercial person. Which is why they leave after five years, because they have better person. Look at what you have in Saudi. You have two-thirds of 35 million under 35 years old. I'm not saying they are underprivileged. I'm just saying address your needs to those who need you the most. And if you do it with your heart, and if you accept to train them, and you accept they will make mistakes, you will have plenty of people. The question is different if you're in America and if you're in Western Europe, because those people are more demanding, they probably had better privileges, better luck in the world, and then they're asking you constraint hours, and then they're looking for a job they can do via a computer, which is flex office. The biggest challenge post-COVID, it's really how could you respond, and it's our fault again, whether it's Marriott, Hilton, Accor, we have been forcing for the same employee for 20 years in his life to do the exact same job and sacrificing nights, weekend away from family. When you close a hotel for 18 months, that person realizes the price of the sacrifices he never measured before because he was working. And all of a sudden, he loves the time he spent with the parents, the children, and he's looking for a job when he can work remotely. And of course, when you work in a hotel, you cannot work remotely. Of course. So again, which is why my answer is pretty complex, because it depends who you are addressing in terms of geography and population. But one of the things we have to do is, how could you re-attract people? They accept sacrifices. One of the answer, don't ever ask people to do the same job more than two or three years. Make sure you're going to be elevating that person to a different job with less sacrifice. And that's why we didn't do well for the last 25 years. And at the end, what I'm trying, and I'm looking at the design here, and looking at this country, and I was listening to the people before me on mining industry trying to defend themselves. And of course, we need them, and thank God they exist. But I'm trying to convey a message to the outside world that the hospitality industry is acting for good. When you discover a culture, when you give chance to a person underprivileged, when you have the craftsmanship artisan working for you, all of a sudden, human capital interaction is why you come to this, to this industry as opposed to work for the big Google, Microsoft of the world, where you have a headset, yes, you have a computer, but you have no human capital interaction which makes you better and stronger. And so we have to redirect hospitality. What do we do for others? My job is to be a caretaker. That's about it, welcoming people and being a curator for those people. So, Mr. Kosai, I, I saw you nodding while uh, Sebastian here was talking about, I think it's, it's the human element when it comes to jobs in the hospitality and labor uh, uh, industry. And I think that's what makes it even more important to attract talent into this sector. So, Tell me your thoughts. So, um, it's, again, it's really important to highlight that tourism and hospitality in specific will be, and it is today, adding to every other sector, from real estate, from human capital, and other, you know, again, mining, industrial, power, and so on. It's horizontally integrated with different sectors. And therefore, what we've been trying and we are working on as an ecosystem, tourism ecosystem, is to build career and progression for hospitality, for tourism. This thing was not there before. It was a sort of hit and run. I mean, you just get a job, if you better, if you get a better job, higher package, you just leave. There is no clear zero, zero, one human capital for tourism. This is, has been changing. What we're doing today, and as Sebastian mentioned today, and what His Excellency the Minister mentioned to him yesterday and today, we're building global standard human capital academies for tourism, building the right career path, progression. Again, this is very, very important for the sector and for one of our main KPIs for tourism is increasing the GDP to the global average. Today we are 
below average, and also to increase, to enhance Saudization and increase and open opportunities for Saudis and increase jobs to the well-known target that I think most of you know. So this is when it comes to job creation and Saudization. And again, it's very, very important for international investors. For us as a fund, we are, I mean, one of the mandate is to help private sector to hire the right Saudis to help private sector to utilize all offers within the country to bring and educate and train Saudis. Um, I know this has this been an issue for some global investors, but it's changing. Um, I mean, if you compare the situation today for compared to a few years ago, there is a lot of progression, of course, a lot of progress. Um, it's really important to highlight that we're not after a short term, we're building the sector for the long term, and a lot of projects that we're working on today are for the long term. Um, again, it's, it's, it's really important also to mention the unlock of private sector, the unlock of the vehicles that will attract the tourists. So today you can see from very little activation, be it concerts, Riyadh Boulevard, some other seasons, you see huge demand from locals and regional, but soon, once things are more activated, we will have more international visitors. And therefore, this integration between tourists, local Saudis, having the mindset of that tourism is one of the right careers for locals, this will be, I mean, one of the major attracting sectors for locals, not only Saudis for also some other people in the region. Great. Um, I want to discuss the macroeconomic landscape today. And what worries me is that it's going to impact hospitality and leisure industry. And my question to you, Greg, is we're seeing higher costs across the board. We're seeing higher energy prices. We're seeing central banks tightening policy. Um, they're withdrawing liquidity that was pushed into the system. And eventually, with this much withdrawal of liquidity, it's going to affect how much income is disposable for citizens to travel or to, 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 to you know, enjoy the hospitality and leisure industry. To what extent are you worried today that this economic landscape might impact this industry negatively in the year to come? We, you don't know me well. I'm always worried. So, so I, <laughs> That's not a good news. I spent, no, no, I, I'm, I think that makes, uh, Kusai runs a fund, Sebastian Manfredi run companies. I think people who worry about the economic environment tend to be good managers. Um, worrying I, I do exactly the opposite. I never worry. Never worry? Okay. <laughs> okay. But we have a balance on the panel then so, today. <laughs> so, so I would tell you that, that what right now what we're seeing is um, 34 percent of people in and all these statistics come from online 34 percent of people intend to travel more with rising costs 46 percent of people tend to tra want to travel more than last year so some of this has to do with repressed dem demand we all have grandparents and parents you might have put off seeing them in 2020 you might have put off seeing them in 2021 but when 2022 came up, you definitely are going to go see Granny, and you're going to go make that trip. Um, and what's interesting is people talk about travel as a homogeneous industry. It's fairly heterogeneous, as, as Sebastian was saying. Geography is different. Um, the age of people, people who are young and people who are old, are tend to tra traveling more than people in the middle. Um, and there's always an opportunity in every downturn. So in the middle of COVID, when Sebastian was um, laying off all those people, we were buying Hertz, right? So, so for instance, we recognized a trend that because people couldn't travel internationally, they would probably rent cars and drive locally. Those of you who went to Europe, I apologize for all the rental car pricing um, <laughs> uh, across. And, and so 
Hertz, no, you don't. for instance, one of our companies, had its best year ever in 2022, its second best year in, tw in 2021. And so there's always an opportunity to try to get people to travel because as Sebastian Cusai and Manfredi all said, it's what people want to do. At the end of the day, the, the reason I'm not that worried is travel ends up being a force for good, right? Mm -hmm. People travel all over the world. If I take a high-minded approach to Saudi Arabia for a second, I've been coming here for a long time and Freddy and Sebastian have been coming here for a long time, but the pace of change and reform here is just staggering. Like in the last five years, the difference in the, in, in the attitudes and the reform has been so astounding it's hard not to invest here. And so I think it's an obligation for those of us who, who, run in the, who run the travel industry and who are important in the travel industry to reward those investments that you're making in infrastructure with visitors and activities. Because if the, if the people of Saudi Arabia want that pace of change to continue and are enjoying that pace of change and you're spending all this money, visitors and locals have to show up to, to, to take advantage of that reform. And so I'm not that worried about the economic environment. Manfredi, I want to ask you, is it going to cost me more to go on a cruise next year? It's going to. Is it going to cost me more? Would I have to pay more to go on a cruise next year because of... Uh, we hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I don't hope so. We hope so. In reality, uh, I think that the, the hotel business has been much better at getting good rates. The cruise industry, the problem is that when you get a ship sailing and you tend to get all the ships sailing at the same time, you have an excess of capacity being offered. Mm. Now, what has been a problem over, uh, more, I mean, for all the travel industry is the lack of people. I think that you agree. So a lot of hotel companies, I don't know about Accor, have been reducing capacity. By reducing capacity, you can keep higher rates. And the people had two years of non-vacation, two years of non-spending on vacation, they were willing to spend more. So the cruise industry is not benefiting of this, but at the end of the day, consumer will always look, what is a vacation on a cruise ship gonna cost? And what is a vacation on a hotel gonna cost? Hotel, then you have to add flights, uh, taxis, moving around, this and that, food, which is all included in the cruise line. So the cruise lines used to be, I think, about 60% efficiency compared to a cost of a vacation comparable in the hotels. I think that now it's 50% cost or less. So it's really very competing. Now that's the reason why a lot of cruise yes. lines are uh, trying to look at how they can go in the hotel space. And a lot of hotel space is looking at cruises to try to extend their pricing capability in the cruising space. So that is uh, something which is a mismatch. You would say an arbitrage which is in the market between low pricing for cruises and high pricing for vacation. For on the point of uh, the um, recession, and, uh, I always see it as a timing factor. Mm -hmm. We always saw that every crisis brings up a higher growth later on. Mm -hmm. And it's only a question of how much time it will take, what is the damage in between, and if you have staying power. Yes. Staying power means that you're not gonna be suffocated by costs and death. If you can handle that, there will be a better world thereafter. Okay. And of course, what Greg has been fantastic at doing is taking advantage <laughs> of the opportunity at the moment. I did my little job. I bought, I sold my cruise line, Silver Sea, which I'm not the chairman anymore, because now I'm a chairman of another cruise line called Crystal, which I bought during the pandemic. And I paid at 6% of the price of what I sold Silver Sea for. But now, of course, I'm investing to grow it and to make it as big as what Silver Sea was which is a nice job for the next 10 years. Great. So I have one minute, 30 seconds, and Sebastian, I think the key question here at the end of this panel is, is leisure and hospitality industry ready for the next crisis? Oh, yes. No question. No, no, madam. I told you we've been going through hell. We closed. We lost 90% of our clientele. And two years after, we're very much alive. We probably better, stronger company because we had time to think, to reflect. Um, we may end up into minus one, minus two, minus three percent recession in the Western world. Let's face it, we live in a messy world. It's unbelievable. You take probably all the countries on this planet, 
with the notable exception of many countries in the Middle East, it's a mess. So we're going to be having some headwind. And if it is a minus 2% recession, it will not be the same. And you will have, of course, growth in this region. That means our industry will probably going to go down 2% because there's a direct correlation between ref bar and GDP. When you know how to cope with minus 80%, believe me, <laughs> minus 2%, I'll, I'll enjoy my life very well. So it's, it's fine, I'm, if, if I may, because I, I'm trying to push everybody to change the way they think. For 50 years, hospitality players have been catering for the traveler, which is normal because we're selling a bedroom and a shower. For the next 50 years, and I started seven years ago, turn it upside down. Stop thinking of the travelers. You should be inventing brand for the local community. I, I, I. Make it a brand where people want to go to dine, have a wonderful experience, to be entertained. And don't you worry, if you succeed in doing this, it's called the lifestyle segment. Yes. Then the travelers will pick your brand because this is a brand the local community love. If yes. you can accept 180 degrees to change your way of thinking and acting, then you probably will conquer the world. If you want to conquer the world, that's another question. This that's is not, another this question. This is not my ambition. Thank you so much for joining uh, us thank today. You. And thank you, thank you our much. audience, for being with us today. We wish you safe and happy travel all years to come. Thank you.